Welcome back to another episode of Six Degrees of Associations. I'm your host, Lucas McCann. With us today, we have Kanika Pulliam, Assistant Director of Professional Development at the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Did I get it right? Yep, you got it right. It's a mouthful. That is a tongue twister and a mouthful. Welcome, Kanika. Thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, why don't we start out and tell us a little bit more about yourself, your current role, and how you found uh, associations. Yeah, yeah. So like Lucas said, I'm Kanika Pulliam. I'm Assistant Director of Professional Development at ASBNB. That's the acronym. Like um, yeah, <laughs> I've been in the education, career development, kind of professional development field within associations for about 10 years now. And so more so I got into that area because I have a science background and I was previously working at a private liberal, liberal arts college um, under a grant program. And I also did some teaching there. So I worked a lot with students. And so when I moved from the area up to the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, I decided I still want to do something uh, within education and in doing my job search associations popped up. And so that's how I've ended up kind of within the professional development kind of area. And I've, I've been loving it ever since because um, it still allows me to stay close to the science without actually doing research and being at the bench. So I can interact with the scientists, the researchers, the students and all the members. And so it, it's really fulfilling work because I can uh, I can help out people in that way. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that seems to be a common thread in our industry. People want to help. They want to be part of a, a mission driven organization. And, and you found it. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about you shared kind of pre-show. One of your first roles in associations was with I'd say, I'd dramatically say a small association, but it was helpful in your path towards um, learning and understanding value of professional development. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. I first started out with a really small association. It was really kind of managed under like a, an association management company. Um, just the two of us. Uh, I was like the education manager there in um, International Society for Advancement of Cytometry. It was about 1,500 members. Very small. Um, the, the members were very engaged. They were all in. They were very helpful. Um, learned a lot from them. Uh, I joined that society because I worked on that particular type of technique that that society focuses on. So I was familiar with it. So it wasn't too, too much that I had to learn. But as far as the learning came from the association side of things. And so with that, uh, the executive director that I worked with, she'd been in association management for a good number of years. And she also had her CAE. And so she told me about uh, different programs and what some of the lingo means, because really coming from the scientific world or even from the academic world, the association management language is is completely different. And so it was like, well, what does this mean? So we would spend hours uh, during the week just kind of chatting and talking about what it meant. And so she recommended some different types of courses that I could take. And these were all virtual, which was nice. And again, this was pe pre-pandemic taking virtual courses. And so one was with F FSAE, the Florida Society for Association Executives, they have a really nice, uh, I would say, uh, virtual course that goes through the basics. It's about 10 modules, goes through dif different types of themes like communication, governance, volunteer management, uh, advocacy. And that just gave me a little bit um, knowledge of association management so that I could go back and it could help me uh, as far as communicating with my colleagues. That didn't mean I mentioned all that to the members, but it helped me do my job better. So that was a good first taste of understanding association management. Yeah, the language um, can be a barrier. I, I remember years ago, we're going a decade and a half, maybe two decades ago, going to ASAE annual meetings then. And one of the highest attended um, sessions was how to sell to association. And it was just flooded. The room was packed. And partly because they were all trying to figure out what you just said was the language. And in retrospect, I wish I could have gone back, taken those courses and given them to my wife, because I think I share with you, it, it, it took her 10 years to be able to describe associations in a cocktail party setting. Um, but it is, it is so important that they understand the vocabulary, the language. And so if there are any young professionals uh, that are just getting into associations, um, shout out to FSAE and, and their curriculum. So 
take us through the, the progression after you've kind of gotten your feet wet in the association. What was next? Yes. Yeah, so what was next? I mean, I did some other type of virtual courses while I was there. There was one like a volunteer management type course that I took through ASAE. Um, they have a lot of great virtual professional development um, type resources there. But this one involves some gamification. And so whoever else was also taking this particular course, it was like you were competing with each other for points. Uh, so if you finished the module earlier or was the first or second and you got more points than your than your other the other participants, or if you did additional assignments, then you uh, got more points. Or if you completed the entire course, uh, first or second, third, um, then you got more recognition. And so it was really, it helped engage uh, me as a new person to association management. Uh, and I thought it was really fun. I learned a lot. I still have this three ring binder um, that I use now that I flip back to for the resources. And I implemented a lot of what I learned there at uh, ISAC. Uh, as an education manager, as far as like thinking about how to recruit uh, volunteers, members um, into different committees. And it's like creating like a job description. Yeah. The gamification, um, you know, pun intended, has changed the game in a lot of ways, because I, I think there's been so much research that's been done around how people learn and how we can absorb and sort of tapping into sensory and, and um sort of cognitive principles has really advanced the way that we can absorb this type of information. Gamification, I think, is a lot of fun, too, because it, for me, it taps into my old competitive roots of, you know, all things sports related. And so I, I think that's that has been used in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm just curious to see how things evolve there. Yeah, I, I would say gamification is still pretty big, even... Um, with the virtual virtual meetings uh, during the pandemic, we yeah. incorporated a lot of gamifications within uh, the virtual platform so that if people did certain tasks within the virtual setting, then they there was a leaderboard so you could see you know who was first, second, third, if they completed certain tasks. So it made it fun for attendees, even if they were sitting at home or maybe you know in their office that they actually felt like they were interacting with people in a live setting. Yeah. And even if you weren't on the leaderboard, I know exactly what you're saying. I've seen those on the board. It's fun just to see who is and yeah. is it somebody, you know, and does it change? And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for some people not to be first. And so I, I think that's one end of it. And then it's other, it's also entertaining for some of us to just kind of watch depending on, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's being, what's being, what the challenge of the day is, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I heard another video I shared, um, in the context of, yes, do the courses, um, understand, go through those knowledge base hubs and things like that. But you also mentioned be a leader, which I think was really important. And that in being a leader, sometimes you would be nervous and pushing through that. Tell us a little bit more about that today in your mind, the emphasis on being a leader. What does that mean? I would say being a leader is actually, you know, being a role model for other people, you know, you may be nervous and not quite sure exactly what you're doing at that time, but, you know, you have enough knowledge, um, things that you've learned. So, you know, take what you've learned and just go for it, I would say. And so a lot of times being a leader doesn't mean necessarily there's a certain title um, or you're the, the boss or the supervisor or the CEO, but it's how people right. view you. And if they're looking up to you and they feel like, hey, I want to be you, you're really motivating me in my position. Um then that's, that's the best way to be a leader. Yeah. And balancing that, I would say with, you know, we talked about also being somewhat humble, right? It, you knowing that yourself that nobody knows everything, there's always things that you could be working on from a professional development, personal development. Um, how do we, how do we set an example of being humble in that sense and pushing through the nervousness of, of not knowing and being okay with that? I would say let people know that, hey, I don't know it all. Um, let's take, you know, maybe let's learn together and do this, you know, as a group or let's share what we've all learned together because I feel like everybody's going to take something differently um, from something. And so that's a, a good way to be a, a humble leader. So people don't feel intimidated by you, um, but they also kind of know like, hey, I can still contribute and I can also teach you know, this person I see as a leader, uh, something new. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that can oftentimes break down a lot of walls and open up new levels of communication and engagement individually with groups. Um, it, it's, it's, it's another barrier that you kind of have to get through personally to let that guard down. But um, as you said, you just, you have to do it, take the first step and, and charge ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You got to take risks. There you go. Is there, so I often tell people, you know, I have a lot of scars. I've taken a lot of risks. I'm just, my life would say I'm too much of a natural risk taker at times. <laughs> that's okay. You learn a lot when you take risks. And I would say that's uh, proven true. I have a lot of scars. As I would tell people from things that I've done that just didn't work out. I love to share those. Are you, are you open to sharing something that maybe not necessarily a scar, but something you could look back and say, oh, I would have done this differently or I mean, you could start today, but I mean, just in retrospect to your career to date. Yeah, I would say probably just utilizing my network um, of people that I know and even people that I don't know. Um, networking usually, you know, is something that a lot of people fear. We talk about it a lot at the association I'm at now, um, especially with our younger members. Um a lot of people struggle with networking and it's, it's, it's everybody. And so it's really getting, putting, getting out there, putting yourself out there, um, letting people know what it is that you do. Um, it may feel like bragging. Um, that's how I've always felt that, you know, if I'm telling people all these things about myself then they may see me as just, you know, someone who's, you know, all I think about is themselves, they're narcissistic. Right. And so sometimes I tend to, you know, not share as much and may come off as maybe quiet sometimes, but that's not the case in my mind. I'm kind of thinking like, they don't want to know this about me. So really it's just utilizing, you know, your network. If there's certain different types of events that you'd like to attend, then do that. Even if that means, um, I mean, there's even like virtual events that you can do, go to. I've learned like, um, like I've been to like Fridays at four. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of that. It's every week on Fridays at 4 p.m. And um, it's more so a lot of networking. You meet people there. And I was able to meet people in person at the ASAE annual meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Even as far as using, utilizing my network and taking risks is that I've been learning to, even when I'm collecting business cards, is actually following up with people. Like I usually keep like this stack of business cards right on my desk oh, in yeah. front of me, but I don't necessarily follow up with people. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still learning that now is to follow up with people, check in with people every so often. So they kind of, you know, you're still kind of, they remember who you are because sometimes you meet people and then, you know, it's like you disappear. It's a difficult balance too, I would say, of um, going you know wide or deep with the relationships, right? It, it, you can go and get, you can know thousands of people or you, or, or and, and maybe it's both and, or you can know a set of people really, really well. And I think that's, that's a learned skill of balancing that. Um, the follow-up, as you said, without necessarily, you know, needing to spend, you know, a full day, you know, circling back with unless that's unless what that's what you want to do mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about since you mentioned um asbmb and and it comes up in conversation there what what are those conversations like in terms of how do you talk about networking for members or for staff yeah that's what, it looks different so a lot of times with what we call our trainees they could be someone who's still in some kind of training program a student they don't have a, a full-time job so they're still kind of figuring out what they want to do with their life and what's the next steps as far as where they should apply. And so for them, networking is all? really important. Yeah, yeah, we're still figuring that out now. And so- right, What do I want to be when I grow up? Right? Yeah, yeah. What's the next 10 years look like? Right. So networking, you know, it may mean, um, like for example, at our in-person annual meeting, we have different types of events where people can network. So that may mean going to this feet networking event and meeting people, but being ready with somewhat like your elevator pitch, uh, 30 seconds usually, uh, it depends. But we also have like this program, which is our art of communication program. And so it's not necessarily like your elevator pitch of what do you like, what do you do like your resume, but it's more of like, tell me about your science or your research in a short length of time so that it captures people's attention. And so networking, yeah. it can look different um, depending on the member. Um, it may even mean, how do you dress for certain types of settings? The handshake, eye contact, 
um, actually talking to people and not just being in the room. I've seen people where they come to an event, but they may stay in the corner and maybe they sit down somewhere and they just, you know, eat the eat the food and the drinks, but they don't actually talk to anybody and they actually make yeah. any connections. And so I really encourage people to make those connections, but then also follow up afterwards. And so some of this has also translated into creating mentoring programs to make sure people are networking. And that means we're gonna pair you up with a mentor. So now you're gonna keep in touch at least for a year um, without sort of the pressure of feeling like you're walking into a room with people you don't know, but at least you've kind of touched base beforehand, but you you meet in person at the annual meeting. Yeah, there, people handle that differently. I, I've learned that some people can just walk into a room, meet everybody in the room, they have the gift of gab, so to speak. And there's another end of the spectrum on people who you know, aren't just nervous. I mean, can be paralyzingly nervous about that situation. And there are some strategies. I would say, you know, uh, shout out to a previous guest, Deidre Daniels. She's the owner of the, the, the Interesting Conversation Company. I don't know if you know Deidre. She runs a course called How to Be More Interesting Than a Cell Phone. And I huh. think it's just incredible name, but it also teaches some of these strategies. And she's not the only one that has these, but there are lots of, and maybe we can include some in the links to the episode yeah. of things that you can do professionally to develop. And it's just a, a couple little strategies that can take you from sitting at that table, eating your food, not talking to somebody, uh, to equipping you with just a couple of strategies to go out and start the conversation. Because I promise everybody who's listening, there are people who also have that same reservation about talking to people and it's difficult to get the conversation started. Um, some people just need to get started. And again, some people it's going to be kind of a constant tug, but just know where you are. And I think self-awareness is. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. I know someone okay. um, that they prepare for networking and they prepare by yeah. actually watching sports. So they know a little bit about every sport, what's going on. They watch the news. So depending on what the topic is, they know how to start a conversation with the person. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. So it's like they're doing homework <laughs> before going out to network or even just depending on the setting. Maybe they're at a restaurant, uh, sitting at a bar or something, and they start talking to somebody and they have something to talk about. Yeah. And that's the, the people that have the gift of gab do that, prepare. And the people who don't, should also prepare. Uh, we prepare for so many things in life, right? We prepare for the CAE exam. We prepare for um, our roles within organizations. We prepare to go to school and get educated. And And why are we not preparing for networking? Because to your point, it is so important. Yeah. It's like public speaking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which is scary. I mean, it's in the same vein. I mean, there's um, you know, Toastmasters is, is just like, it's a whole program, national, international program about getting prepared just to talk. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I've been we, involved we, in Toastmasters. There you go. Yep. 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 It's a great. It's a great program. And I just think there's so many things that it's not a, it's not necessarily a faux pas or, or it, I think it's just something maybe that's not talked about as mm -hmm. is those people who are, you look at them and they're, they're working the room and it like they have prepared. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, they know who they're going to, who's going to be in the room. They know maybe a couple of brief facts about them, even if they're writing it down and putting it in their pocket. I know people who do that as well mm -hmm. and just kind of keep like a, a reminder list because I'm not great at remembering everybody's name. And so if I go to somewhere, I'm like, hey, who is that? Like, <laughs> what's that person? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, whatever it takes, again, there's just the self awareness to know that um, what are your strengths? what are not your strengths and then preparing around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I love the idea that you all are preparing members for that because again, it's not typically part of a value prop for an association. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's really big up there, I would say. And yeah. I feel like that's for everybody, even the people who think they know what networking is not, they don't. <laughs> No, they think it's just showing up and, and maybe absorbing and listening, but you have to contribute too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big part of it. Well, let, let's shift gears. I want to talk about um, your time at McKinley because it's been a lot of association talk, but you took a stint at McKinley and, and tell us, you know, what drew you in there? You know, what did you like about that role? Yeah. So I, I took, I don't maybe I'll say maybe a short break from being on the staff side of an association. And I decided I was thinking 
you know, I want to stay within association management, but what does it look like from the consulting side? And so mm -hmm. um, at a previous association, we worked um, with this particular group, um, McKinley Advisors, the consultants on different types of projects, um, yep. mainly like doing like a membership survey. And so I was aware of them and I, I saw a position posted. It was a business consultant position. And I was like, huh, this looks interesting. And so I spoke to someone there and, and I decided to apply. Um, so I worked at McKinley as a business consultant um, there uh, for about a year and I, I learned a lot. And so it's a whole different side of association management working as a consultant because now I was still working with the association staff, but I was mainly working with the CEOs, executive directors, or people who are at the senior level um, positions within their departments. And so it's like I learned even more about association management as far as like strategic planning, helping associations with their strategic planning, um, thinking about what types of programs they're managing and how successful they are, or should they decide to sunset these programs? Should they keep going with these programs? Are, and even are they even making re revenue on some of these programs? Um, yeah. Thinking about the member value, there was so much that I learned as a consultant that I can still utilize now being back in an association. Um, and even um, doing the business consultant side of things, I did a lot of data analysis. And so mm -hmm. just looking at membership data, how is your association doing as far as um, uh, retaining members or thinking about should you decide to increase your member dues? Because sometimes people don't change uh, member dues for over a decade. Now that's great for members, but when you're thinking about- I've, I've heard it, I've been in those conversations. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Like, Yeah, yeah, but there's always, people still need, to, you know, you still have to make some money to maintain, you know, the, the business, uh, the, the association and people have to understand that. And so- I learned a lot about just analyzing data and what that means for running an association. Um, so it was great. I worked with a lot of great people there um, and I learned a lot. It was a good experience. Are you, are, are you able to point to, you know, maybe one thing or one example that you would share that now you're back on the staff side, you've, you've implemented or, or just seen in a different light? Yes. I would say just thinking about, there's so many things I can I can think about. Let me think of one. <laughs> I'm thinking about um, member value, um, and that necessarily doesn't mean that we're making money from it on the association side. But are the programs that we're actually implementing is it bringing value to the members? And so there's different ways to look at that. And so it may be that we've had this long-standing program for decades. But is this really what our members want when we think about what's going on in 2023 and beyond? And so it may be that maybe 10 people are signing up for this program. And they're like, well, it's successful because we're still getting people to sign up. But <laughs> is it worth the staff time? Is it worth the money that's spent on it? Um, could we implement something new um, and much more innovative that probably would attract more members um, or even non-members to participate in this program. There's so many ways to kind of think about just uh, what kind of programming and the member value. Yeah, I, I read an, e, uh, an article recently that sort of an, an up and coming title in the association was just chief value officer, right? I and mean, it was just <laughs> that. It was somebody who was focused on how much actual value um, something that was quantitative and qualitative, I assume, right? So it's not just your CFO looking at, does this program make money mm -hmm. uh, or is this just a drain on the budget? And it's not necessarily just member, how many more members is it bringing in? But, you know, this sort of overarching idea of we're going to filter everything through this lens of value first, which I think makes sense. Yeah, it's important. I mean, that's how people decide if they're going to renew their dues or not, or even if they want to become a member is, you know, what's in it for me. And so what's difficult is that associations now we have to start thinking about um, things just like Netflix or Amazon, uh, where people yeah. are paying their money um, and to those kind of things. Well, in that same vein, and going back to the ones who haven't increased their dues, <laughs> they're increasing you know, Netflix, for example, because 
just a very simple business strategy, the cost of goods sold is going up. And so in turn, um, the prices have to go up if for no other reason. Ideally, you're adding and layering in new levels of value that should be pulling your dues up or at least being reviewed yeah. um, maybe every couple of years and looking at the structure and all that. But if nothing else, folks, the cost of goods sold in, in the industry yeah. is going up. Yeah. Staff, the staff costs are going up. Event costs are going up across the board. Oh, yeah. It, you have to be looking at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, meetings are expensive. <laughs> and more and more by the day. Well, Kanika, two two fun ones I want to throw in. Like, what What is one thing that you look forward to most each year? I would say as like coming to the end of the year, like December, I start thinking about my new goals, like my personal goals. I mean, also my own goals um, for my job. But I always like to do like a vision board. I get my family together and we do like a vision board, uh, uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, we collect magazines and cut out pictures and just think about what are our goals for the year. And so that's always something important um, that uh, I like to do. But I also think about um, not just like a list of goals, but what's my one word of the year that I'm going to focus on. Um, and network has been there, I would say, for the past two years. And I'm probably going to add it again uh for 2024, but with a different type of intention. And so each year is kind of like I'm adding on something a little bit different, even though it may be the same word. Um, well, oh, that's what I I'm love that say. idea. Does every does everybody bring different clippings and things and then you come together and put it all together? Yeah, well, we put we all have our own kind of a big poster board. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, we paste them onto our own uh, poster board, we'll put our name on it. And then we'll usually we'll post it up on a wall in our own room. Like I'll put mine up usually in the office. Um, my daughter will put hers in her room and my husband, uh, he'll do his own. So That's fantastic. Yeah, All right, mine. I'm stealing that one. That one's going into the McCann household this year and <laughs> the kids can get their own board. They'll love it. My wife's a teacher. So she's off for winter break here in a few weeks. And so they have the time to put it all together. I love that idea. Yeah. Well, one last question. What is, what is something uh, about Kanika that we, we wouldn't find online or on your resume? <laughs> Probably something about me. Um, I'm a I'm a gym rat. I'll say that. Okay. Um, I like picking up heavy things, <laughs> heavy weights. <laughs> uh, I've been, I would say, doing a lot of weight training for at least the past 15 years. I really enjoy it. Um, it really gets the adrenaline going. Um, it's a big stress reliever for me, uh, yeah. to work out, be in the gym. Uh, I really enjoy it. I mean, I also do some yoga sometimes, maybe bike ride and do some cardio, but, uh, lifting weights is what I enjoy the most and really leg day is where it's at. Um, Oh, leg day. <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody would agree with you, but the results are good. And so as a follow-up question to that, as a final follow-up, is it, are you a morning gym rat? Do you, are you are you getting up early and getting after it? Are you kind of like the midday break or do you nope, chase I'm the, the night out? Early morning person and people would think I'm insane. Um I get up I would say before the pandemic, I would get up consistently at 4:45 in the morning and drive to the gym. And then once the pandemic happened, I kind of built my own home gym. And I decided that before that, I had two different gym memberships. Um, and it depended on the time of day and what worked best, which gym I would go to. But I found that if I bought my own weights and certain kind of things, then I could cancel one membership and I could save money. And so I primarily work out at home for the most part. But I also go to the gym when I want to do certain kind of things or lift even heavier. So early morning, is that's the best way to get in a workout. And it's just the mindset. And so I get up around 5 a.m., um, to work out. That may take about an hour and a half, two hours. And that I, if I don't do it in the morning, it's not going to happen in the evening. So I, I got to do it. <laughs> you and my wife, I just found out, are kindred spirits. She also wakes up, sets the alarm at 445. She was going to two gyms before the pandemic, built a home gym, uh -huh. bought a Peloton, got the weight racks and just, you know, wakes up. That's her time. She gets the coffee and Celsius going. She gets down into the basement gym and she she gets after it early. So. Uh, wow. It works. It works. <laughs> 
Well, Kanika, I, I hate to wrap us up, but um, as we do on Six Degrees, is there somebody else that you would like to recommend that you think our audience would benefit from hearing from? Yeah, I would like to recommend Sylvie Song. Um, she was one of my colleagues that I first worked with um, when I first started working in association management. Um, she's the senior conference manager at FACIP, and that's the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. Um, that's what we first uh, both started working there. Um, still, although she's no longer my colleague, we still interact a lot. We do all kind of weird kind of exercise stuff that she gets me into. Like uh, recently she had me uh, doing flag football where I kind of injured okay. my, my hands because I, I realized I'd never caught a football before. <laughs> but um, Trying new things. Yeah, but she's a joy and I feel like she's, you know, very underrated she knows so much about association management and running conferences. She would be a great person to talk to. Well, thank you for the referral. Thank you for another tongue twister. And it sounds like another individual like yourself <laughs> who should be talking more about all the great things that they're doing and um, telling the world. So thank you again, Kanika, for joining us. Pleasure was all mine. All right. Thanks for inviting me, Lucas.